Now, uh, in the course of this uh, session uh, and in the course of our conference, uh, the topic of sanctions uh, occupies a special place. The discussions held by our center, our other think tanks, both in Russia and in other countries, we pretty often uh, check uh, our views on sanctions against the views of others. Now, sanctions is a contentious issue, and uh, this is an area where there is no consensus, there is no common approach besides the approaches uh, uh, vastly uh, different. Therefore, it will be extremely exciting to hear from experts. So what's their take on sanctions? How they view sanctions uh, with relation to non-proliferation? What are the challenges and problems uh, that we face uh, under the proliferation regime and how sanctions can impact those? Perhaps I can take uh, one minute to briefly introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, let me explain why we selected uh, such a composition for this panel. The first to speak will be Mark Fitzpatrick, who for many years uh, has been responsible for these issues uh, working for the State Department of the U.S. and uh, U.S. Embassy in other countries. Tari Krauf, for many years, uh, has been part of uh, the academic community, research community, and international organizations community, such as IAEA. He also worked for the Canadian government. And uh, he contributed a great deal to the preparation of uh, the uh, uh, MPT. Mr. Mikhail Agasandian deals with uh, relevant issues uh, at the Foreign Ministry of Russia. Apart from other uh, positions of his, uh, he used to work uh, for the Russian uh, rep office. Uh, at the UN. Now, uh, we tend to uh, discuss the various issues uh, within the same community, community of experts who share views, uh, share uh, approaches and mechanisms. Uh, therefore, of special uh, importance uh, for us will be uh, participation of Bijan Hajipur, the founding partner and managing partner of Athen International. Bijan was born in Iran, now he lives in Austria, and uh, he provides consulting services to the companies wishing to penetrate the Iranian market. That's why we found it extremely interesting to invite him, and we want to hear from him. What's his uh, view uh, with respect to the sanctions impact? How such sanctions could uh, affect or uh, have affected or whether they have affected uh, the attempts to resolve the crisis around the Iranian nuclear program. On top of this, we will have two commentators. And the commentators will speak right after the panelists. The commentators are Said Hossein Sadat Meidani, Professor of International Law at the School of International Relations uh, from Iran. Uh, it would be extremely uh, interesting to hear from you, uh, Dr. Uh, Maidani, uh, how sanctions uh, impacted the situation in Iran. And Dmitry Kiku, member of the expert panel established pursuant to the Secretary Council um, Resolution 1874. And uh, he is our international bureaucrat, if I may call him. So perhaps he can also share with us his uh, view on uh, how sanctions uh, impact the situation around the Korean Peninsula and the entire situation unfolding there. Now, first to speak, Mark Fitzpatrick. And uh, I encourage all of you to speak from your seats, and then we'll invite the commentators. Thank you. Mark. Thank you very much, Anton, for inviting me. Uh, you put together a brilliant, brilliant conference, and congratulations. I will make it clear that I no longer represent my government. I speak as an individual, of course. I might be in the minority in this room, but I clearly believe that sanctions can be helpful, and not just because they are a more justifiable means than military action to enforce uh, international agreements. Sanctions are typically adopted with various goals in mind, uh, not just as a means of pressure to compel changes 
of behavior and policy. Sanctions are an enforcement tool to punish states that violate non-proliferation obligations and to deter other states from following a like path. They're the enforcement mechanism to compel compliance with international commitments and norms. In addition, sanctions are a means of denial to prevent the transfer of materials and technologies that can be used in the development of banned weapons. Uh, for example, sanctions and export controls that prevented Iran from obtaining a reliable source of ingredients for the solid fuel for the Sajil-2 uh, ballistic missile are probably one reason why that missile has not been tested since February 2011. Sanctions can slow missile and nuclear programs. They can make procurement more expensive and difficult and increase transparency. The argument that sanctions are counterproductive uh, holds that stank states that are sanctioned uh, respond defiantly under a siege mentality uh, by ramping up the activity in question. Until negotiations with Iran began in earnest in 2011, uh, 2013, for example, the situation was sometimes characterized as a race between sanctions and centrifuges, and the centrifuges were winning. Every time that new sanctions were imposed, Iran increased its uranium enrichment production. But I believe this would have happened anyway. After all, Iran's work on nuclear weapons, which the IAEA diplomatically called uh, activities of a possible military dimension, that took place before 2004. This was before the first UN sanctions uh, were imposed the following year. So Iran's nuclear weapons work was not stimulated by sanctions. Rather than ask, asking whether sanctions are counterproductive, one might ask, are they effective? And here the evidence is mixed. I believe the deterrence impact of sanctions is greater than realized, and it's often invisible because as U.S. scholar Nicholas Miller notes, they involve states' tacit decisions not to start nuclear weapons programs. Importantly, sanctions also were important in bringing Iran to the negotiating table in earnest in 2013. The Iranian leadership wanted to remove the sanctions burden on the economy. Of course, sanctions alone were not responsible for this outcome. Mutual compromises by pragmatic leaders uh, were crucial to striking a deal. So it's wrong to claim, as many in Washington do, that sanctions were the key to the Iran nuclear deal. But it's also wrong to claim, as some do, that sanctions were irrelevant to the deal. Hassan Rouhani campaigned on a pledge to remove the sanctions in the election of 2013 because the Iranian public uh, were uh, weary over the economic impact. Now, in the case of North Korea, sanctions have not been effective in stemming the testing of nuclear devices and ever longer ballistic missiles. Nor has North Korea been willing to return to the, negoti uh, to the negotiations with the goal of denuclearization, which had been the basis of six-party talks. North Korea's program appears to prove the adage that if a country is determined to have nuclear weapons, it will get them even if it has to eat grass. One answer, though, to why sanctions have not been effective in North Korea is that they have not been strong enough. Only in the past year have the sanctions on North Korea reached the level of sanctions that were imposed on Iran. Also, North Korea is less susceptible to sanctions. It's far more isolated to begin with. It has been protected by China and Russia from biting sanctions. Recently, uh, Russia has been providing extra economic support to North Korea, including providing a new internet connection. I fear this is going to facilitate North Korea's cybercrime. 
But I do note that President Putin uh, this week signed a decree to impose several bans on North Korea in compliance with UN Security Council Resolution 2321. China is also imposing uh, tighter restrictions. But North Korea's autocratic government is not beholden uh, to popular opinion, so that makes uh, sanctions uh, more difficult to have an impact. In the 1990s, North Korea uh, endured suffering far worse than sanctions when it lost concessionary trade upon the end of the Soviet Union. Perhaps up to a million people starved in North Korea at that time, and it did not result in any change to the government's budgetary priorities uh, or its restrictions on foreign uh, food relief organizations. Still, I think that it's important to try all policy tools to effect change in North Korea, combining uh, sanctions with engagement and diplomatic compromise. The key is whether there is a pragmatic government in North Korea like there's been a pragmatic government in Tehran. And I don't see that pragmatic government. In conclusion, three final thoughts about sanctions. First of all, universality is the key to making sanctions work, hence the emphasis on UN resolutions that are universally applicable. The trade-off is that UN sanctions often are more mild than unilateral measures, and often they are not implemented uh, very robustly. Too many countries tend to give proliferators the undeserved benefit of the doubt. Second, sanctions are reversible, so they can be used as bargaining chips in negotiations, which means that they have to be lifted in exchange for concessions. States that apply sanctions have to be willing to lift them if the targeted country accepts a negotiated outcome, as was the case with Iran. The lifting of sanctions cannot be fitful based on domestic political considerations or the personal prejudice of a new president. Thirdly, sanctions have to be used judiciously. They should be applied when they can be more effective than other policy tools in achieving the desired results. And there has to be clarity and realism in regarding these desired results. In the United States today, many of the critics of the JCPOA are not clear about what they want, nor are they realistic. So in conclusion, sanctions, I believe, can be helpful in creating leverage, but they're only one tool, and they must be used in conjunction with other tools, and they must be lifted when deals are reached, and the lifting has to uh, uh, remain lifted uh, if uh, compliance uh, is uh, continuing. So thank you very much. Eric. Thank you very much, Anton, and I would also like to join Mark in thanking you for inviting me to this conference, and I think this has been a remarkably successful and very useful conference, so thank you very much. Um, full disclosure up front, I personally am not a fan of sanctions. I agree with some of the things that my good friend Mark said, but I will try and make the case why, in my view, given my experience at the IAEA dealing with some of the high-priority verification cases where uh, international and national sanctions were implemented. In my view, the results were counterproductive. So are nonproliferation sanctions a good policy tool? In my view, no. Do sanctions check or reverse proliferation? I would say that the record is decidedly mixed. Can nonproliferation sanctions be counterproductive? I would say yes. Can and have non-proliferation sanctions affected behavior change by the target states? Generally speaking, no. Have non-proliferation sanctions adversely affected civilian populations in target states? Yes. Have non-proliferation sanctions been successful in dealing with the cases of Argentina, Brazil, India, Iran, Iraq, Libya, North Korea, and Pakistan? The answer, in my view, is clear that coercive pressure in, this, in these cases did not succeed in reversing what is referred to as proliferation behavior. However, there are two cases of success, uh, and this is in the cases of Taiwan, uh, sorry, in the cases of Taiwan and South Korea. 
But these were allies of the United States, and therefore the U.S. could bring pressure to bear in a way that was different from these other cases, because both of these countries also relied on U.S. Uh, security assurances. Do sanctions increase the cost to the target state for WMD activities? Yes, they do. Do resilient states accept the cost of sanctions to continue nuclear or other WMD programs? Yes, those states that have made this decision at the national level, whether they are democratic or less than democratic, will pay the price. And Mark, in one case, referred to uh, a country willing to eat grass, but there's a book that refers to another country eating grass and developing nuclear weapons, which wasn't North Korea. Um, is the United Nations Security Council a credible entity to implement sanctions? This, this is a tricky question, and I will develop this a, a little bit further. Is the listing of individuals and companies for sanctions and Security Council resolutions legal from the perspective of the rights of legal persons? And is redress available to such legal persons? And is there a mechanism for the termination of sanctions against legal persons and entities for compensation? And here the answer is no. And a good example is the termination of sanctions on individuals and entities that were sanctioned in Iraq. So people whose names appeared, they had no legal redress to defend themselves. So certain countries that had intelligence information or other information about names of companies or entities or individuals placed them on the sanctions list, and these, people were, these entities were completely deprived of any rights for redress, explaining their case. Uh, a Canadian lawyer was subsequently employed by the Security Council on a case-by-case -case basis uh, to get uh, redress, particularly in the case of some individuals that were caught up in sanctions after the unfortunate 9-11 uh, attacks in the U.S., people who were terminated as people who were determined as having connections with uh, terrorist organizations. Another important question is, do sanctions lead to corruption in enforcing and target states, international organizations and international businesses? And again, the record says yes in some cases. You had the oil for food um, issue uh, in the case of Iraq. There are allegations of corruption regarding sanctions enforcement uh, against Iran in Iran and outside among neighboring states. So why are sanctions still the preferred policy options for most Western states? Is it because of failures of policy? Is it because of neo-imperialistic attitudes? Is it because of inability to reach negotiated settlements until it is way too late? I would say perhaps a mixture of all of them in, in varying degrees. So sanctions generally are considered as retaliatory international measures, most often involving trade or financial restrictions, but also restrictions on technology, as Mark referred to in his presentation. Uh, and as, again, Mark stated, and I agree with him, uh, in pursuing international issues, sanctions often are posited as offering a middle ground between diplomacy and the use of military force. Uh, objectives of sanctions are stated to be, one, action to demonstrate that something is being done in response to uh, negative behavior, perceived or real, by a state. Deterrence, to dissuade both the target state and others uh, from repeating or continuing or initiating such behavior. Constraint, to use economic or technological restrictions to interfere uh, or restrict the continuation of objectionable behavior. And fourth, coercion, to lead to desired behavior or outcomes. So if we um, look at the historical perspective, the very first mention of sanctions actually came in 1919 by President Woodrow Wilson in the context of the League of Nations. Uh, as you know, the League of Nations never really succeeded. So the next reference to sanctions, particularly in the case of nonproliferation and international security, came on the 14th of June 1946 in the Baruch Plan, which called for condign punishment that when an adequate system for control of atomic energy, including the renunciation of the bomb as a weapon, had been agreed upon and put into effective operation, condign punishments would be set up for violations of the rules of control, which were to stigmatize such international crimes. 
The IAEA statute, which entered into force in July 1957, refers to a suspension or termination of technical cooperation by the agency in the event of unresolved uh, safeguards matters. And Article 12 on safe agency safeguards in the statute, particularly paragraph C, uh, refers to the direct curtailment or suspension of assistance provided by the agency or by a member state, uh, and even the call for the return of material and equipments made available to the recipient member state uh, in the case of uh, uh, non-compliance that has not been remedied uh, by the state concerned. And the IAEA may also suspend any non-complying member state from the exercise of its privileges and rights of membership, and this is Article 19 uh, of the IAEA statute. The Non-Proliferation Treaty itself does not contain any reference to sanctions, but if we look at uh, Decision 2 from the 1995 NPT Review and Extension Conference on Principles and Objectives, Paragraph 9, for the first time, stated very clearly, and this has been reinforced by all members of the NPT on a consensual basis in 2000 and also 2010, that the International Atomic Energy Agency is the competent authority responsible to verify and assure, in accordance with the statute of the agency and the agency's safeguard system, compliance with its safeguards agreements, and that states' parties that have concerns regarding non-compliance with safeguards agreements of the Treaty, of Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, such state parties should direct such concerns along with supporting evidence and information to the agency to consider, investigate, draw conclusions, and decide on necessary actions in accordance with its mandate. Tarek, you have 30 seconds before sanctions will be imposed. Okay. <laughs> So, in, in conclusion, uh, I believe that in the two particular cases of Iran and NDPRK, sanctions didn't work. Had the negotiations carried on that were started in 2003 re were implemented at that time, we would have had a much different outcome. And same in the case of the DPRK, we would not have yet another country crossing the nuclear weapons threshold. Thank you. Tarek, thank you so much. Now let us move on and give the floor to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, Agassandian. Mikhail, please. Thank you, Anton. Thank you very much for the invitation. I think that against the backdrop of the previous speech, mine uh, would be an apology <coughs> to sanctions, but believe me, this is not true. You know, uh, in order to set uh, the correct uh, pace for the discussion, let us uh, think of what kind of sanctions we're talking about. Uh, in general terms, uh, sanctions uh, could be split into three groups. Universal sanctions imposed by the Security Council, national sanctions imposed by individual countries as a piggyback to the Security Council imposed sanctions, and this is the kind of practice we've been observing recently, and unilateral uh, sanctions, uh, and also sanctions imposed by various regions and alliances. Unilateral national sanctions cannot be a, an efficient tool to address uh, proliferation issues because the issues and threats are, are by nature transnational and global. And these could only be uh, opposed uh, by joint effort and not by efforts of individual uh, countries or groupings of such countries. Sanctions imposed on top of uh, Security Council sanctions have a lot of limitations. They undermine the integrity of constraints agreed by the Security Council, and they devalue the agreements reached. In the end, such sanctions may uh, indicate to the fact that the countries imposing such sanctions uh, cannot uh, assure effective uh, negotiations. In fact, uh, such sanctions may serve as a tool to uh, affect sovereignty and national interests of our respective uh, target countries. And this is what we observe uh, with the DPRK. 
Now, the practice of using unilateral restrictions and extraterritorial application of national uh, legislation and sanctions, and this is something that we increasingly observe in the practice of some of our Western partners, uh, prevent from developing an open and fair trade system and international cooperation in general. Now, uh, the true universal uh, implementation of uh, the steps needed to ensure uh, non-proliferation uh, is not assured by such sanctions. Therefore, for us, uh, the subject of discussion uh, should be the sanctions imposed by the uh, Security Council. Now, what is the current situation with sanctions? This whole mechanism is uh, fairly new, and uh, it started to be employed in earnest at, only after the breakup of the bipolar system. Our review of sanctions indicates that the impact of sanctions and uh, their effectiveness in addressing conflicts uh, would be minimal. Uh, in most cases, uh, sanctions uh, only invigorate uh, the process of peaceful settlement of conflicts and disputes. Uh, and uh, it also creates a lot of collateral problems. There are a lot of negative consequences uh, for the population of countries uh, that sanctions are leveled against. Uh, all of this is uh, relevant in the non-proliferation domain. Uh, look at it uh, in an unbiased fashion. Does this mean that there is no place for sanctions? Not at all. We should just assume uh, that all sanctions uh, should be properly sized. And uh, we also should understand that uh, this is a secondary mechanism. Uh, it is a part of a long-term search for political settlement for the benefit uh, of the entire international community. And all kinds of consequences should be taken into account. Therefore, we always assume that sanctions are an important uh, tool uh, used by Security Council, and they can help uh, to reach a political and diplomatic settlement uh, for a problem. However, this is uh, a measure of last resort. Now, let us look at some specific uh, situations uh, in a number of countries. Uh, obviously, uh, the uh, most urgent problem uh, is the problem in North Korea. We're sure that sanctions potential uh, has been pretty much exhausted. Uh, what has happened in the last several months uh, should convince uh, all the skeptics uh, that uh, sanctions alone cannot uh, resolve this problem. We know the experience of 1990s uh, and sanctions against Iran and uh, Yugoslavia. It shows uh, that uh, further tightening of sanctions uh, will not take us anywhere. We know of the tragic fate uh, of Iraqi and uh, Libyan leaders uh, that uh, rejected their weapons of mass destruction programs. Uh, they trusted the West. Uh, we uh, also uh, look at uh, how frequently uh, Security Council has been uh, imposing new sanctions. Uh, it looks like a race. Uh, however, uh, what is important uh, is that the existing sanctions uh, are working, and there are quite a lot of them uh, now, by the way. Uh, all the Security Council uh, resolutions uh, have a language uh, that uh, demands that parties look for a political solution. Therefore, uh, those uh, people who uh, demand new sanctions uh, essentially do not uh, do their part of the job. Uh, this looks uh, like another manifestation of double standards. Uh, sanctions pressure can be uh, successful only if there are active diplomatic efforts uh, accompanying uh, the sanctions uh, campaign. We uh, don't have to go far to uh, find good examples for that. Uh, look at uh, uh, JCPOE, uh, which has become possible uh, only at the time uh, when 
uh, countries uh, focused uh, on a creative search uh, for solutions that would be mutually acceptable. As a result, uh, we have uh, an agreement that has become one of the biggest breakthroughs in recent years. Uh, in this context, it's important to say that uh, if uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear deal uh, was to fail, uh, it would send a, a very bad signal uh, to Pyongyang it uh, would seriously deteriorate uh, the situation and it would make uh, North Koreans uh, doubt uh, the uh, a point of uh, rejecting development of weapons of mass destruction uh, in exchange uh, for uh, security assurances and lifting of uh, sanctions. We should uh, look at the issue uh, in a broad context um, and not in a formal way. Uh, we uh, should uh, see uh, what can practically be done uh, to stop transfer of technologies and materials, uh, what can be done uh, to affect uh, uh, cash flows uh, in the regions. We should not take a simplistic view of the problem. This approach does not always uh, bring uh, desirable results. Uh, there are many sides to this problem. In uh, the uh, current globalized economy, uh, limiting uh, economic cooperation uh, does not always uh, work uh, effectively. One can slow down a process, but uh, only a comprehensive uh, solution uh, can really address the real challenge. And sanctions are only one of the tools in the kit, and that's how they should be viewed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, special thanks uh, to the uh, translators uh, for uh, handling uh, this a uh, fast delivery. Uh, next, we're going to give uh, the floor uh, to uh, Bijan Hajipur. Um, Bijar uh, is a consultant. He was born uh, in Iran. Uh, he resides uh, in Europe. One of the uh, tasks uh, of his business is to help international companies uh, do business in Iran. Um, Please tell us, uh, what was the role of sanctions uh, in achieving uh, success uh, in an uh, Iranian nuclear program? Over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank Anton and Dimitri for inviting me and also organizing this excellent event. Uh, I would like to uh, make a couple of general comments about sanctions, a lot of good points have been made, uh, and I think it's clear that there is a range of opinions uh, on, on sanctions and also that sanctions are viewed differently from different perspectives. And Mark talks about sanctions as a tool, uh, as an instrument to achieve goals, um, uh, and uh, others, when you are at the receiving end of sanctions, you obviously look at it as an unjust escalation of uh, uh, of, of a relationship which usually, and we saw that in the case of Iran, begets further escalation. And the question I have as, a, as an international consultant is whether the leverage you create, as Mark says, you create leverage by imposing sanctions, whether the leverage you create is actually worth it at the end of it, because you also lose while creating leverage. And in the case of Iran, we can see that loss very clearly. And, and uh, Ambassador Tarek uh, uh, pointed to that. You know, you, you lead to economic, social, structural consequences that actually uh, create a different dynamics, a negative dynamics, and I will show that in a minute in the case of Iran. I want to mention one other thing, general thing about sanctions, which we have witnessed very clearly in the case of Iran sanctions. Uh, even though sanctions are, are introduced as a tool, uh, it seems that they they develop to become the goal themselves. And that is the downside of, of using sanctions very extensively because once the sanctions become the goal, uh, then you don't think about the original goal anymore. And the goalposts also change. In the initial phase, we heard we are sanctioning Iran to change the nuclear uh, calculus in Iran. Towards the end of it, they were saying we are sanctioning Iran to bring Iran to the negotiating table. <laughs> 
So you can see that the actual goal, the, the policy goal, uh, is not necessarily the one that is kept. Uh, what is kept is that there is a, almost an industry to produce sanctions. And that, that answers partly your question. Why do Western governments continue to use it? Because they actually have a huge sector, a huge bureaucracy to produce sanctions and monitor sanctions and then introduce new sanctions and escalate further. And that is the downside of using an instrument where you have so many, so many challenges. So let's now look at the Iranian case. Um, were the sanctions effective economically? Yes. They, they undermined the Iranian economy. Uh, they changed the strategic calculation of international companies who wanted to invest in Iran, especially oil and gas companies and, and multinationals, uh, who at one point, especially when the sanctions were heightened towards 2007, 2008, a lot of them started withdrawing from the Iranian market. And of course, this had an impact. This had an impact on the technological development in Iran, on the economic development in Iran. But did these sanctions change Iran's nuclear calculus or even Iran's foreign policy? No, they didn't. And that is, again, let's go back to the original goal. In my view, they miserably failed to achieve the original goal. What did they achieve? They had effects on the Iranian economy. As we heard from Ambassador Tariq, they led to corruption. If you sanction a country like Iran, you are opening the door to sanctions circumventions, to sanctions busting, to illegal trade, to smuggling, to money laundering. I'm sure 20 years from now, someone will analyze the negative impacts of these sanctions and point to the fact that a lot of the shady illegal networks in our region were empowered during these sanctions. If we wonder where the money flows come for ISIS or for other extremist uh, forces in our region, I'm sure someone will one day point out that these sanctions cl created a, a, an environment, a corrupt environment that, that facilitated this type of uh, uh, basically networks. Shade, I call them the shady networks, the dark forces. Um, so let us look at some other facts um, in Iran. I also agree with uh, Ambassador Tarek who said uh, if the, the Western governments, especially the U.S. government, would have employed other, uh, other tools to, to achieve this goal, it would have been a completely different outcome. And in fact, Iran's nuclear capacity would have been lower than what it is today. I'm sure that if the 2006 uh, deal would have been accepted, it would have been a completely different uh, dynamics. Let me just point to some other, because Anton asked me to talk about the economic impact. Yes, the impact was there. Iran experienced two years of economic decline in 2012 and 2013. But one point that I always made during those um, those years as well, was that the only cause was not the sanctions. There were there was corruption, there was mismanagement. Some of it was indirectly related to sanctions, but there were other reasons. So to believe that the lifting of sanctions would immediately address all the economic issues in Iran would also be a mistake, and that was partly now the other side of the coin, the expectation in Iran that as soon as the JCPOA is implemented and sanctions are lifted that everything will be great again was also misplaced. So you have the other side of, of that coin as well. Um, so in summary, the answer to the question, can one achieve goals with sanctions? I would say sanctions have effects, but they are not effective. Thank you. Thank you, Bijan, for your presentation. Uh, As I mentioned, we do have two commentators. Uh, and I invite uh, the first one uh, to the stage, Dr. Sadat Maidani, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Antoine, for having me here and also to organizing such excellent conference. 
I listened, in fact, carefully to the previous speakers, which I appreciate and believe they uh, raised interesting food for thought on the subject of the panel. Of course, because of the temporal limitation, I cannot dig into the all aspects of what raised, but I try to be brief and to comment, and sometime in a general manner, in a holistic approach, uh, on the subject of the panel, taking into account the Iranian views and experiences uh, from sanctions imposed during the past decades. Generally speaking, uh, I, I share views with others that sanctions may or may not catch their objects, but there is a big if on that. And it depends on different principles and conditions to be met. On the, on the relevancy and uh, legitimacy, always there were questions, as well as on its efficiency. On the, legit on the legitimacy of the sanctions, I think that, in fact, the principal rules shall be given in the first instance to the Security Council rather than the unilateral sanctions. Unilateral sanctions rarely show to be effective. There is an important element to be taken into consideration, although sanctions called as an alternate for violent reactions, war, and also diplomacy, but sometimes the negative effects of the sanction may be even uh, more devastating. So everyone shall take into consideration the past experiences from Iraq sanctions. As well as in the Iran's case, it's now well documented that the sanctions vis-a-vis Iran did a significant incidental negative effects on medical and humanitarian trade with Iran. So that was not only the economy to be affected, but also other humanitarian and uh, medical to be affected by the sanctions. Having said that, and hearing the other panelists, I think we may reach five uh, general conclusions on sanctions. Uh, of course, depending on which seat you have been seated on that, so. Uh, it's a general conclusion that I reached here and I noted here. My first general conclusion uh, is that it seems in the case of non-proliferation, which is a self-contained and a collective regime, any sanction shall be duly decided within the UN collective security system at, at the first instance. We need collective wills rather than unilateral actions no country can decide for others. Additionally, additional autonomous sanctions not only are not helpful, but also in so many cases exacerbate the situation and may paralyze the efficiency of the already taken sanctions by the UN. Uh, the second conclusion that we may reach is that the cause of sanctions always shall be determined in a complete and a reasonable matter. Facts are important. If we miss the facts, so we cannot target well. Uh, sanction cannot affect and cannot be efficient on uncertain or unstable reasonings. Relevant facts always shall be conclusively or at least satisfactory to be decided and proved prior to any introduction of the sanctions. That's a mixed part, and that was the missed part in the case of Iran. Because so many facts, if you go into the details of the facts, uh, was not uh, correct. And no one could corroborate, corroborate uh, the, uh, the relevant allegations. The third conclusion that I think is important to be taken into consideration is that the object of the sanctions also must be, must be legitimate and achievable as possible, or as uh, Marx said, to be realistic. To, sit, to set an object for sanction which may deprive permanently nations to benefit from their rights under the MPT regime would negatively affect the efficiency of that sanctions. <clears throat> 
as well as the well-functioning of the regime in general. Rights and obligation in this regime is very important. Hopefully today, in the case of Iran, we have a well-balanced agreement, the JCPO, J JCPOA, which makes the balances between the rights and obligation by both parties. The, thick, the fourth conclusion that I want to propose is that the sanction must be implemented smartly and there shall be always proportionality between the targets and the sanctions. Regrettably, today that is not the case. Still, we are not taking lessons from the history. We are witnessing that little by little, resorting to sectoral comprehensive sanction is going to be replacing the past announced policy for smart sanctions. That was the case in the case of Iran. Almost all sections, almost all sectors of Iran were affected by the sanctions. And remember, that was only for some limited failures in the language of the IAEA. Nothing never proved in the case of Iran that there were diversion toward military purpose uh, through nuclear activities. And, the, and I want to share with you a statistic which is important. Only 0.20% from the total budget of Iran is devoted to nuclear energy. So 99, 80% the rest or for other sectors. All other sectors were sanctioned because of 0, 20% from this statistic. We see that that was not uh, the case from the case from the point of proportionality. And my last remark and conclusion is that is on determination, which was uh, emphasized uh, by the distinguished panelists. Sanctions shall be terminated or relieved as the situation may improve. Unfortunately, we are witnessing a habit of sanctioning others is spreading these days. Additionally, once a sanction is imposed, hardly it would be imagined to be terminated or be relieved in near future. Normally, sanctions last for a long time even if the objects have been met. I want to raise some development, positive developments during uh, the negotiation between Iran and 5 plus 1 that never take into consideration. And in return, we neither, not only we did not have lowering or relief of the sanction, but also to increasing the sanctions. We have here with us um, Ambassador Sultania here. We had the work plan in 2007. What happened exactly after the signature of work plan with Iran? Resolution 1747. We, we concluded all six categories of so-called suspending technical issues with the IEA in February 2008. What was the reaction? To have a new resolution, 1803. We had the uh, swap, so-called swap agreement with Turkey and Brazil, and again we had the resolution 192. So I believe sanction needs to be introduced in a more time-bound manner to have temporal sunsets, and if need needed to be renewed later on. Thank you for your patience. The next commenter. Uh, Dr. Kiku uh, uh, has put together a presentation. If you want to get a copy of a PowerPoint presentation, we have uh, made hard copies. Uh, they are available on the presentations table. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an honor uh, to get an opportunity to speak at such a forum at uh, Moscow Non-Proliferation Conference.
As Anton said, I have uh, uh, put together a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we have many copies that you can uh, get outside of this room. It uh, may be of uh, interest. Uh, in November of this year, it's been 11 years uh, since the uh, Security Council has introduced sanctions against uh, uh, DPRK. Uh, the main purpose of the sanctions uh, was to prevent uh, development of nuclear and uh, missile technologies. Uh, the first uh, resolution, uh, 1718, uh, established a committee uh, with participation of all Security Council members. And uh, then uh, three years later, uh, 1874 resolution has uh, created an expert group uh, to uh, help the committee. Um, altogether, uh, since October 2006, uh, Security Council has passed uh, nine uh, uh, resolutions with uh, sanctions, responding to six nuclear tests and several missile launches, uh, which uh, is quite unprecedented uh, in the UN history in terms of quantity and uh, content. Uh, most of the resolutions uh, took place in the last two years, and here is why. In 2006, uh, Pyongyang uh, conducted two uh, nuclear tests, uh, January 6 and uh, uh, September 9, and they launched uh, a missile in February. Altogether, North Korea has conducted 18 tests of 26 ballistic missiles of different types. Uh, between uh, January and October of this year, uh, DPRK has conducted 14 uh, launches uh, uh, 17 missiles were launched, and that includes two ICBMs, uh, according to Pyongyang. The launches have taken place on the 4th and uh, 28th of uh, July. Uh, September 3, uh, they conducted the sixth nuclear test, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, of greater yield uh, than the five previous tests. In the latest uh, presentation for the UN Security Council, a group of experts uh, has stated that uh, uh, DPRK uh, programs uh, show high level of diversification. Uh, they have a higher range of their missiles, and uh, they also uh, show higher uh, level of operative uh, readiness. Uh, in this uh, context, uh, I would like to give you another example. Uh, the expert group has been uh, watching the development of the uh, missile and nuclear uh, program in DPRK. And um, a turning point was the uh, military parade that took place uh, in April of this year in Pyongyang. Uh, DPRK uh, showed a, a broad range uh, of uh, new missile designs, uh, what uh, makes uh, the state of uh, rocket industry different from uh, where it was in the past uh, is that uh, DPRK needs uh, significantly less time uh, to showcase and then successfully test uh, new missiles that they have at their disposal. Another example. A ballistic example of medium range Masadan type uh, was first demonstrated uh, in Pyongyang uh, at a parade in 2010. Uh, after several failures, uh, they had a successful test in 2016. Uh, it has been enhanced, and the enhanced version, Huangsong 12, uh, was uh, demonstrated at the military parade in April of this year. And then uh, it has been successfully uh, tested. Uh, it uh, uh, flew uh, in a very high trajectory in May of this year. Huangtung 12 uh, was launched twice. Uh, there were two launches in August and in September of this year. Uh, quite a significant uh, range uh, was demonstrated. Uh, the missiles flew over Hokkaido Island of Japan. Uh, the uh, latest uh, Security Council resolutions taken in two years uh, introduced uh, sanctions that impacted uh, specific sectors of DPRK's economy. Uh, today, uh, there is a prohibition for imports of uh, 
um, several types of ore, um, ferrous and non-ferrous metals, uh, nickel, uh, and uh, several uh, types of uh, seafoods. Uh, there is a prohibition to conduct operations with DPRK banks. Uh, all uh, international uh, offices uh, should be closed. The latest resolution of September 11 of this year includes a complete ban of uh, exports of uh, gas condensate. Uh, there are limits uh, uh, to uh, supplies uh, of uh, uh, oil products uh, in uh, excess of the volume that has been supplied uh, in the previous uh, 12 months before the revolution. There are broader and deeper financial sanctions, and there is a prohibition uh, to uh, create uh, joint ventures or cooperative organizations. In this connection, I'm referring to sectoral sanctions, I want to stress that in terms of uh, implementing the sanctions, uh, the resolutions call for uh, banning the uh, supplies of coal by Russia coming to the North Korean ports. And uh, again, despite the strict uh, nature of the sanctions, uh, they are based on uh, notifications. Now, as to the impact of the sanctions on the deeper economy, According to the estimates by South Korea, the GDP of DPRK uh, last year went up by 3.2 percent compared to 2015. I'm referring to the data provided by the South Korean bank uh, because it's impossible to get DPRK data. Uh, these are not published. Therefore, in my presentation, I refer to the source which uh, is at least available. It was noted that the military spendings, including on the nuclear missile program, also helped boost economic growth in DPRK. In March and uh, November of 2016, the Security Council passed fairly strict resolutions uh, calling for complete or partial ban on the exports of metals and metal products. At that time, it was very sensitive to DPRK. The uh, analysis of uh, the per capita <coughs> uh, GDP in the per K suggests that starting in 2016 and in the years that followed the uh, resolutions and sanctions, the GDP has continued to grow. It dropped uh, during year two after the imposition of sanctions, but now the GDP seems to be on the rise. So it's uh, kind of difficult to tell uh, and somewhat premature to speak of uh, the sanctions impact on the deeper case economy because uh, the bulk of the sanctions were imposed uh, late last year. I think somewhere in the first half of the second year we'll be in a position to judge as to the effectiveness of such sanctions. In conclusion, I want to stress that the resolutions uh, leave the door open, the door for a dialogue with the, with the DPRK. All the resolutions uh, call upon resumption of the six-party uh, negotiations. And the Security Council confirms that it will be uh, following closely the uh, actions taken by the DPRK, and it will be willing and ready to suspend uh, the sanctions or to lift the sanctions. At the same time, the Security Council states that it will be ready to impose additional sanctions in case a uh, nuclear test or a missile launch happens. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. We have uh, about 25 minutes for a discussion. First, I'd like to share with you my experience, rather my impressions uh, from uh, the presentations we've just heard. As to the DPRK, well, this session is not being broadcast, and therefore I can repeat that over the past six years, I visited uh, Pyongyang fairly frequently. And despite the sanctions, uh, we uh, observed positive developments in the uh, North Korean economy. We saw many construction projects, uh, food and food processing industry uh, seems to be uh, performing uh, fairly well. The number of services available to the population uh, is uh, fairly broad. Uh, whether new sanctions are going to affect the economic situation, well, 
Very likely they will, but let us not overestimate the impact. And uh, my uh, view uh, very much coincides with Bijan's. Uh, will there be an impact? Yes, of course. Will such sanctions impact uh, the plans around the nuclear program and missile program, which uh, seem to be a priority for the state? Well, I think uh, we have no reasons to believe that there will be such an impact. Besides, the Iranian uh, example mentioned by Dr. Midani is uh, very pertinent. He mentioned uh, issues with um, health care, with drugs. Uh, together with a good friend of mine and a colleague of mine from uh, Iranian International and Political Studies uh, and myself uh, attended a conference in Prague. It was like four or five years ago. And uh, we, uh, there was a question whether sanctions uh, produce any impact. And at that time, he said, you want to know if sanctions are effective, if sanctions produce an impact? OK, go to my room and see how much uh, different drugs and medicines I had to buy, because such drugs are not produced in Iran. Indeed, Iran responded to sanctions by uh, increasing the number of centrifuges, but uh, at the same time, sanctions hit the population hard. Some tend to expect that population would voice their concerns and dissatisfaction, and this might uh, alter the policies pursued by the government. But look, uh, with respect to DPRK, this is highly unlikely. I want to uh, specifically emphasize the message uh, made by Mark. He said that sanctions are important. Well, if we're talking tools, that is true. But sanctions can be extremely counterproductive if sanctions are uh, looked at as uh, a possible solution. I'm ready to uh, I recognize uh, our participants who would like to uh, ask questions. Uh, now, a colleague from the PRK and then Mr. Vichov, please. Thank you, Anton. Uh, actually, I plan to meet Mr. Mark Fitzpatrick last year, January, in Southeast Asia, but due to the heavy snow in America, he, he could not travel. <laughs> So I'm going to react Please. to his points, and I, I'd like to raise three points. Please. Number one, sanctions against DPRK will not work. So uh, we have sanctions, uh, UN sanctions and unilateral sanctions by United States. We have eight or nine UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, I don't give, it, give any care to, to those kind of resolutions, to the, those kind of documents. And as for the unilateral, unilateral sanctions, uh, it began in 1950s by United States. And there are over 20 laws adopted by United States Congress that sanctioning DPRK. But for the 60 years, it hasn't, they hasn't any effect on DPRK. And even I heard the South Korean bank recently declared that our economy is growing, although in spite of those unprecedented sanctions. Paradoxically, sanctions will propel DPRK to become, to be more determined to continue the nuclear arms buildup. And now United States is saying they are peacefully pressuring DPRK to give up nuclear arsenal to join the sanctions and make our other, other countries to join the sanctions against DPRK. But sanctions will not work, and sanctions will give birth to only aftermath. And second point, Mark just said about the cybercrime allegation of DPRK. And I'd like to remind you that um, now we are focusing on the nuclear issue, not the cyber, cyber security. And I think the cybercrime allegation of DPRK is fake news, as well as Donald Trump is recently resisting so many fake news. And third point, you talk about the pragmatic way of thinking. And 
in the dire situation, in such uh, security circumstances we are suffering now, we are getting severe nuclear threat from the United States, the f number one nuclear power of the world. And I think there cannot be no more pragmatic way of thinking to beef up our nuclear arsenal against the threat of the United States. And it is too bad that I could not raise my points to you earlier due to the heavy snow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aksan Nikolaevich Ilyichov. Thanks a lot, Mr. Ilyichov. Good morning. I'll try to concentrate on the topic of the session. As a person who has uh, its uh, fingerprints on all the resolutions on uh, Iraq, or Libya, and then without uh, leaving my uh, fingerprints uh, on the resolutions uh, on DPRK, resolutions of the Security Council, I want to uh, talk about the measures uh, specified by the UN Charter. All the rest, from the standpoint of international law, uh, how should I put it, is doubtful, unless uh, it has to do with uh, defense considerations. Now, the impact and effectiveness of, measure, of measures and sanctions imposed by the Security Council aimed to prevent proliferation of nuclear weapons, well, uh, it is... Uh, not something that is obvious. In terms of uh, Iraq, uh, it was not sanctions that played a role, but a special commission on Iraq. It did uh, uh, significant work. Then there was the second invasion into Iraq by the U.S., and uh, we got certification that uh, Iraq uh, had nothing uh, left of uh, the... Uh, products or developments that Iraq might have had in terms of nuclear or chemical weapons. As to Libya, the outcome was uh, fairly efficient too, although there we had two objectives. First, the idea was to force uh, the Libyan regime to recognize its responsibility for uh, acts of terror and to do something about Gaddafi's uh, intentions with respect to nuclear weapons. I'm not uh, I'm going to talk about what happened next after Gaddafi uh, agreed to address those issues because uh, this is something which is beyond the topic of our discussion. Now, as to Iran, I mean, we heard from Iranian colleagues, and time will show what uh, actually happened and if uh, the Security Council measures played any role at all. Now, what a good friend of mine just said, uh, as in Chen and others, well, the uh, measures taken by the Security Council never by themselves uh, would be in a position to address any uh, proliferation issue, uh, and the same is true for any other political crises. But the DPRK, the problem is that uh, Given a lack of effective uh, political and diplomatic process, all the measures, I'm not talking about unilateral measures, even Security Council measures, any measures uh, become the only tool, the only instrument. And we all uh, witness the outcome. I think uh, such measures only prompted uh, the DPRK leadership to speed up uh, their program. Uh, that is why we are raising this issue during the section. I'm sorry, you got 30 more seconds to go. Now, I think the most uh, dreadful thing happen, happened with respect to DPRK if we uh, forget about uh, on proliferation. Uh, the country and its population uh, have become dehumanized altogether. I cannot recall a single case. Uh, when the Security Council would pass a decision, uh, and uh, I urge my country, Russia, and think about it, uh, a decision uh, that would uh, discard humanitarian uh, considerations. But look, uh, 
UN has virtually no presence uh, in uh, that country. There are no uh, uh, projects that would support economic development, uh, no humanitarian aid uh, projects uh, are present in that country. I think uh, this is an outcome of the overall approach, and this is inadmissible. You see, Mark said that uh, sanctions are used to punish, well, international law uh, speaks nothing about uh, using Security Council measures to punish anyone. The measures uh, taken by the Security Council intend to change the situation, to change uh, political situation, but punish, excuse me, well, we observe for the past 20 years that some countries uh, decided that so they're in a position to punish, demand, and so on, but should be, we should be concerned about the outcome, and we witness this outcome. And this session, uh, I think, should uh, demonstrate that unless something changes dramatically, we are, are heading toward a military conflict. are having a very mixed effect. And uh, what I am reminded of is there has been a debate about the veto in the Security Council. And there were suggestions about uh, if you exercise your veto, you should not do it or you cannot do it unless you have an alternative plan for how would you achieve whatever outcome is required by or desired by a resolution to, uh, to, to have a plan for implementation by not casting a veto. I think the same should happen with the sanctions, because the sanctions by themselves, only thing they do is they basically name and shame and they give a mechanism for a very rigorous examination of that country's record and abuse by other countries or the country itself in the Security Council and then basically propagates it. So there's a naming and shaming and a scrutiny that comes with the sanctions and I think that's one of the purposes of those sanctions as well. So if you impose a sanction regime, and right now there's 16 of them, which is a highly large number, uh, if you have a sanctions regime, then it should be accompanied by a plan how do you implement it? What is the alternative? Or how do you get to a political settlement? And I think that should be one of the requirements that was put forward. There was a review of the sanctions in 2015, but it did not really come out with those results, though it did have a lot of recommendations. The other aspect I want to very briefly mention is that when you look at unilateral sanctions, particularly by the United States, I am very concerned for the simple reason that 80% of world trade is conducted in US dollars. And I'm sorry, the US throws its weight around in this sector. There are tremendous uh, penalties for banks, for individuals, if they are opposing or if they're not implementing the very strong requirements that US banks and the US government imposes on any financial transactions. Now, I know the Asian Infrastructure Bank was only created last year, but my question is, do you think there could be a change in this aspect if the Asian Infrastructure Bank has to get, acquire more clout, even though that would take more years to accomplish? Thank you. Okay, we've got two uh, more questions to go. Vladimir Sajan, the Institute of Oriental Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences. You know, since uh, the 20th century, we've seen a lot of sanctions in many areas and targeted against many countries. Uh, but specialists uh, believe that only 30% of such sanctions proved to be uh, successful. I think that the sanctions imposed in 2011-2012 against the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, were successful. Let us re recall, uh, be between 2006 and 2010, the Security Council uh, six times imposed sanctions against uh, Iran. And four resolutions, uh, in fact, four resolutions out of six uh, contained sanctions, but uh, this uh, did not produce any uh, response, and uh, P5 plus one uh, just wasted their time. However, the sanctions imposed in 2011-2012 uh, by the US and the EU, and the sanctions were chaired by many other countries, well, these sanctions hit the Iranian economy very hard. I would hate to give you specific figures, but uh, the top leadership of the country was forced to 
do something uh, in order to lift uh, such sanctions. In fact, uh, that's why Hassan Rouhani got a green light uh, uh, for his elections, and uh, he uh, had some experience dealing with the nuclear program, and at the same time, he commanded huge respect across the world. Therefore, he managed within a couple of years to uh, reverse the situation, and uh, P plus one in Iran uh, reached the deal. And they managed to have addressed uh, this uh, nuclear issue around Iran. Look, you're a friend of mine, but your minutes is up. Dr. Shabin. Dr. Shabin, Center for Korean Studies, the Institute of Far East. I want to ask a question uh, to any of the panelists. Now, uh, DPRK, to what extent the sanctions introduced against the country correspond uh, to the uh, goals and objectives set by the resolution. Now, the resolution banned uh, the supply of tanks, artillery pieces, and other military uh, equipment to North Korea. But look, uh, North Korea has very outdated conventional forces, and therefore North Korea was in opposition to compete with the US and South Korea, and the sanctions uh, actually backfired. Instead of bolstering up their conventional forces, DPRK focused on the nuclear weapons to uh, reach a balance. So as I was saying, the sanctions backfired. Second point, the sanctions imposed by the Security Council, to an extent they're in line with other provisions of international law. It is known that DPRK signed and joined uh, the uh, Treaty on the Peaceful Use of Space, a number of other conventions that regulate uh, different countries' actions in this area, and many other countries uh, haven't done so. At the same time, DPRK is banned from launching satellites, and this is not the case with respect to any other country of the world. Now, uh, uh, how come the Security Council uh, feels that it is in a position to amend universal laws uh, that serve as the cornerstone of uh, uh, international uh, legal system, including in the area of peaceful use of space. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have no time for more questions. Let us give uh, some time to each of the panelists to respond and react. Please. Uh, there are two questions I would like to respond to. One, the question on the Asian Infrastructure Bank and basically the non-dollar transactions. Uh, it's going to be extremely difficult to change the current situation. Uh, even if you try to take the dollar out of, uh, out of uh, transactions, a lot of international traders, including, for example, Iranian traders, they trade based on US dollar prices. For example, even oil price is obviously uh, priced at US dollar. Uh, after years of trying, Iran has now achieved to, to uh, uh, develop a framework, for example, with Turkey and also with India to trade in local currencies. But even that sometimes is based on, uh, on US dollar, I mean, US dollar pricing and, and, and contractual basis. And that is where, again, the American banking system and Treasury, they have brought in the so-called U-turn sanctions. So if you have a U.S. base, even if it's between two other banks, it somehow refers to the U.S. banking system and can be sanctioned. So unless there is some legal uh, change and also some, uh, you can almost call it cultural change among international traders to move away from the dollar, um, then we will see that. Where we... Where I see more potential in the next 10 years is a, a sort of coin-based transactions. Bitcoins and other coins. Basically, there is an emergence of this blockchain technology where a lot of transactions could be based on non-dollar, and that can create a different dynamics. But right now, with 44% of all the transactions in the world are somehow related to, to the US dollar, and that creates a, a problem. Um, I want to comment on this uh, notion that uh, the Iranians uh, 
after Rouhani came to the negotiating table because of the sanctions. I think it's a mistake to believe that. Uh, the, the question is why did they come to the negotiating table? Two, two reasons. One, the government changed in Iran. We went from a confrontational government under President Ahmadinejad to a more conciliatory government under President Rouhani. But second and more importantly, the, 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 the strategic environment in our region had changed. A number of post-Arab Spring issues and, and, and terrorism-related issues and insecurity issues had emerged in, into the region. And we heard it from Dr. Arakhchi this morning as well. He said, at least now we have one problem less in a problem-laden uh, laden region. And I think that's important. That was part of the Iranian calculation. It was not a response to sanctions, even though sanctions, as I said earlier, had effects on the Iranian economy. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We talk at length about humanitarian uh, uh, implications of sanctions. Um, I do agree, but we feel that uh, the key challenge in this respect has to do not so much with the Security Council resolutions uh, that uh, uh, take into account humanitarian aspects, but uh, the problem has to do with the uh, global financial system's nature and unilateral you know, sanctions are widely employed. I think this is why UN agencies who are authorized and have all the rights to operate in DPRK in reality have to curtail their presence and uh, withdraw. You know, they cannot work in this country without money. And uh, the situation is such just because all the transfers to those agencies uh, are blocked. And Madam Kane was absolutely correct when she said that uh, the U.S. dollar is permanently featured in global trade and global financial system. Uh, this is indeed a problem we've always been facing. You know, there were cases when even Russian uh, transfers to IAA were blocked by the U.S. banks. You know, this is uh, absolutely outrageous, and uh, no single resolution mentions this. So I hope that UN Secretariat will gradually uh, build a better understanding of this issue, not uh, those who retire from the UN, but uh, the actual UN bureaucrats would understand this. One more point uh, which seems to be of importance. It was mentioned that facts are important with respect to sanctions. Indeed, this is true. And it is deplorable to hear statements uh, like, Oh, look, Russia helps North Korea uh, providing telecom capabilities. Therefore, I'm afraid that this might result in cybercrime. Well, look, unfortunately, uh, the Security Council of late uh, has been following this logic, and it's been prevailing among our, our colleagues. And uh, this is not very productive. It does not lead us to any meaningful dialogue. It prevents us from... Uh, hammering out uh, balanced positions. Regretfully, we see uh, that uh, more and more countries increasingly employ sanctions. And this, to a large extent, I think, uh, testifies to the fact that the very uh, culture of diplomacy, culture of uh, negotiations uh, is being undermined. It's easier to hide behi behind the sanctions screen and suggest, look, unless the sanctions are uh, making uh, some effect, uh, we will not talk about anything. We will not lift the sanctions unless uh, the government is pragmatic. But look, who is there to judge if the government is pragmatic or not? Uh, following the current logic, uh, I think that the Pyongyang behavior is very pragmatic under the current circumstances, the circumstances the country is in at the moment. Now, as to the issue you raised, uh, whether the Security Council is in a position to uh, pass decisions uh, despite uh, the availability of other instruments of international law. This is an issue which is uh, highly debated among uh, international lawyers. Uh, but there is no one single opinion on that, but many people tend to believe that UN uh, Charter is uh, the topmost uh, document. And at certain points, uh, the Security Council is well positioned to make decisions that might not fit well 
with uh, some documents uh, that uh, had been adopted previously. Thank you. Tarek. Thank you, Ekka. Um, I see four distinguished ambassadors in this room whom I have the privilege of knowing personally and at the risk of being sanctioned by Ambassador Sultani. I just wanted to correct Mr. Bijan that I'm not an ambassador. <laughs> yes. So do sanctions work? Exhibit A, Cuba. One Cuban diplomat was said, so far from God and so close to the United States. <laughs> Cuba, despite 50 years plus of sanctions, has one of the best AIDS care uh, system in the Americas. It has one of the best universal health care systems in the Americas as well. So if sanctions couldn't work in Cuba, that's one good example of how sanctions can punish innocent uh, citizens and not necessarily affect behavior change. Uh, in the political leaderships. I completely agree with Mr. Bijan's comments about the rise of this sanctions industry. But there's also the rise of a sanctions bureaucracy in the United Nations itself with these different committees and their groups of experts. Um, I wanted to quote uh, former UN Secretary General Boutros Ghali, who said what somebody from the floor pointed out that sanctions are supposed to affect a change in the approach of a state and they are not for the punishment or adoption of repressive measures against states. He also said that sanctions used unilaterally or multilaterally as an instrument of pressure or retribution exceed the framework of the United Nations Security Council, particularly if applied extraterritorially and universally. In the cases of Pakistan and Iran, of Pakistan and India, once punitive U.S. sanctions came about on Pakistan after the withdrawal of Soviet troops uh, from Afghanistan, that directly was one of the causes for the creation and establishment of the so-called AQ Khan network, which involved individuals and entities from more than 30 countries in all continents. A direct result of punitive sanctions. So when a government is determined to follow a particular course of action, in pursuit of how it defines its national security interests, they will pay the price. Other, there are other examples as well. China in, after its nuclear test in 1964, India after its test in 1974, Iran. Uh, if the deal had been made with the Rouhani government again in the 2003 to 2005 period, it would have been very similar to this deal. At that time too, Iran wanted to maintain a small enrichment capability, but it didn't have 20,000 centrifuges. It didn't have more than two tons of enriched uranium. And that, too, was the pressure that brought the other side uh, to, to the table. And my final uh, comment on, on, on this uh, issue is um, that sanctions are very controversial in the sense that they're driven primarily by the permanent five members of the Security Council, which under Chapter 7, Article 41 of the UN Charter have been given this responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. But who are the biggest purveyors of weapons to areas of conflict? It's the five. Who are the biggest possessors of chemical weapons? It's among the five. Who are the biggest possessors of nuclear weapons? Among the five. Who are the biggest possessors of ballistic missiles? Again, amongst the five. So here we are asking the foxes to guard the chickens. So I have a great credibility problem with the Security Council when five countries that have the veto, that have the greatest number of conventional and non-conventional weapons, are preaching about the utility or disutility of these weapons to non-permanent members. They occupy the non-permanent members of the Security Council and chairing many of the committees of the Security Council. The non-permanent members feel very proud that they have this committee to chair and there are very little energy left to deal with the big questions of the day on international peace and security. So it's up to us, those who come from the non-permanent members, uh, to be more active in questioning the role of the Security Council. And while I do support the United Nations and its role uh, as the preeminent international organization for the welfare of the world's peoples, we also need to make sure that it's, it is not misused and the powers of the more powerful countries are not misused. Thank you. Mark, please. Uh, we don't have time for...
uh, neither Russia nor China uh, have initiated any uh, resolutions uh, with sanctions in the Security Council. I, um, I won't be able to address all the points, uh, both because of time and because I no longer represent my country, so I don't have to defend every uh, <laughs> accusation that was made against the United States. I think the, uh, the comments from the floor and the other panelists fall into two categories. One, are sanctions legitimate? And two, are sanctions effective? With regard to legitimacy, I maintain that international agreements without an enforcement mechanism are less valid, less practical, less effective. So what enforcement mechanism do we have besides sanctions? Military action is not something that I think most of the audience would recommend. So yes, the Security Council has a right to impose sanctions to enforce international commitments, I maintain. Second, are sanctions effective? We've heard many examples of when sanctions have not been effective. Uh, we've heard many uh, suggestions of counterfactuals of how things would have turned out better had there not been sanctions. You cannot argue counterfactuals of what might have happened. But I did note one thing important, very important that Tariq said at the beginning when he noted the two cases of effective sanctions. They were not UN sanctions, they were US unilateral sanctions vis-a-vis uh, -vis partners, allies. <laughs> so this leads me to think maybe it'd be better if the United States had more allies. Uh, but I, I hesitate to say that in Moscow. Um, expansion of NATO is not what I'm recommending right now. But it does remind me that maybe, maybe the Soviet Union, when it was an ally of North Korea, should have used sanctions at that point to stop North Korea's march toward nuclear weapons. And I disagree that it was U.S. sanctions that somehow spurred North Korea. I remember when Barack Obama extended the hand of friendship to North Korea at the beginning of his term. That was a time we could have achieved something. And what was the response? A missile test, a nuclear test. So don't tell me that it was U.S. pressure that forced North Korea down the nuclear weapons path. Nuclear weapons won't save North Korea from its fate. The United States never has sought to invade or attack North Korea after the Korean War, which is started by North Korea. Conventional weapons in North Korea's hands were effective as a deterrence for them. They didn't need nuclear weapons at all. And I really very much agree with Bob Carlin, what he said the other day about, you know, we have to pull up or we're going to crash. I am sure that if something is not done soon to solve the North Korea problem, there will be many, many more sanctions applied. And if you don't like what you've seen so far, you're not going to like what's coming down the pike. So I really implore um, all parties to, to work with North Korea to persuade it to stop the path that it's on. Colleagues, we don't have any time for discussion. discussion was extremely... Colleagues, we don't have any more time for this discussion. This has been extremely interesting. Uh, let us uh, thank all the uh, presenters and commenters.